How many of you have popcorn in your hands? No one? I'm the only one. Um, I just wanted to bring this up with me this morning because right after the service, we do have popcorn um, for all the fathers and uh, the rest of us uh, right after church. And so don't miss out. There's about six uh, flavors out there. Um, just to show you, I do have popcorn in here. See? Uh, this will be for me. And um, we're going to leave this right here. So it's a constant reminder. And for those of you that are a little HDAD, good luck. Um, we're continuing a series uh, today titled Warrior. We started a couple of weeks ago. It's uh, like Danae say, er, said earlier, it's for men, but for everyone. And we're looking at how God wants to develop us to be uh, the warrior that he wants us to be. And so we started off with acknowledging that there's a gap between where we are today and where God wants us to be. We always know that something inside of us needs to change and develop and grow. And so we talked about the gap and we talked about God's calling, that God calls us to follow him, to become uh, warriors for him in the world that we live in today. And as fathers and as uh, men in the world, we have the opportunity to step into that role, not only what we are today, but what God desires us to be in the future. And it's not necessarily what the world tells us we need to become, but who God is shaping us to be. And so we looked at the definition of a warrior. A warrior is someone who shows great courage and perseverance, one with the willpower to overcome any struggle. And so just to repeat, as we repeat every single week, it's not a matter of if we're going to have a struggle or not. It's a matter of when. We're all going to encounter some sort of struggle, some sort of a difficult circumstance, some sort of situation in life where we're not going to have all the answers. We're not going to go and exactly know what direction we need to go. But God in that works through us so that we can have courage and perseverance. And so week one, we looked at God telling Joshua to have courage, to have courage and to have courage and to have courage. Today, we're looking at what it means to be, to have perseverance in the midst of struggles or crises in life. There's a text in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36, and it says this to all those that follow Jesus. It says, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And so for the followers of Jesus, if you're following Jesus or want to follow Jesus, this is not a suggestion. It's not a good idea. It's not an option. For those that follow Jesus or want to follow Jesus, this is almost a command. You need to persevere. It's not a suggestion, but more of a direction of how God wants to lead our lives. And so, yes, we need faith to begin things. Like if I'm starting a new project, if I'm walking in a different way with God, if I'm wanting to start coming to, to a church or to this church, I need some sort of faith that I can step into that space and things will be okay. But in order to keep doing what God wants me to do, in order to keep going with the plan, plan that God has for my life, the faith that I started with is not good enough for the faith of tomorrow. And so each step of the way, God is wanting to build my faith up. Now, if I want to finish what God has in me and for me, there's more faith needed to require to finish than when I began. Many times we cannot and will not persevere because we think that the faith we had the first day is faith enough for every day. And sure enough, there'll be a challenge, an obstacle, a crisis, a loss, a sickness that will challenge our faith and will lead us to a space of perseverance. Whether or not I'll stick with it in spite of the situation I'm in. Do we have the faith today to persevere in the midst of crisis? Do we have today the faith to persevere in the, in, in the present need? Do we have the desire to persevere when we don't feel like it? The story we're looking at is found in the book of Joshua. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to it or follow along in the screen. We're jumping all the way to Joshua chapter 6. We've looked at the first five chapters, and now it kind of gets to the good part, right? The, the story that if you grew up in church, you heard over and over and over again, that Joshua uh, fought the battle of, okay, you're almost with me, but I, little, I need a little bit more. If I don't get more, then I just start eating more popcorn. Um, Joshua fit the battle of, Okay, we're all together. So that's kind of where we're at right now. They've crossed the Jordan. They're reaching the city gates. And so 
uh, the Bible tells us that the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in to the city. Okay? So we didn't read every single verse before, but in the story of the spies going into Jericho, uh, Rahab tells them, we have heard stories about how God has moved through you and is, has brought great fear. So much fear that this humongous city with, gi with giant walls has decided to lock itself in because of the Israelites that are coming at them. Verse 2 says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, and only Joshua, See that I have what? Okay, want to remember that? See that I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. So Jericho, for most of us, doesn't mean much. Uh, it's a city way out in, in the Middle East. It's still there today, but the walls are no longer there. Archaeologists um, and different people have gone out to kind of see if they have been able to find any types of stones or rocks that resemble the walls of Jericho. But computers have helped us out in 2023. And so this is something um, of what Jericho might have looked like. Now, the first thing that we can acknowledge is that most times in movies or animations for kids and adults, we, we think of Jericho with one solid wall. But historically and with, through the help of archaeologists, they have discovered that it was not just one wall, it was two walls that protected the city. Obviously, if you had some money and if you were of, of, of importance, you were living not out here or here, you're probably living somewhere in here, right? Because the closer you got to the middle, the safer you were. Now, something that we can't acknowledge as much from this drawing is that these walls were not at the same height. So, once again, archaeologists help us out, and they show us that if you were standing outside the outer wall, you were kind of down here, right? You couldn't even see above the first wall, less even the second wall. In other words, the reason for showing all of this and kind of nerding out with Jericho is that when the God's people looked at Jericho, they weren't just seeing a 10-foot wall that was 10 feet wide. No, they couldn't even see the second wall. In other words, if they wanted to attack Jericho and defeat Jericho within their power, it was impossible. So when God is speaking to Joshua, he tells them, see, look, look at the walls. I know you can see one of them, maybe two. Look at them. I have already delivered those walls and the people inside of those walls to you. God is speaking in past tense about something that hasn't even taken place yet. What do we do when God tells us something that hasn't happened yet? When, we, when our realities don't match God's promises. When we claiming something that God said he would do, but when we look at our reality, we just see an obstacle, a wall, a 10-foot wall, 20-foot wall, or 30-foot wall, and we say, God, you're speaking in past tense, but the wall's still there. God, I I I'm trying to be faithful, but this and this and this is happening in my life. God, you said you would be there, but I don't see you, I don't feel you. Many times God speaks in past tense, not because he's already done it, but because he wants us to believe that he will do it. And so that's where Joshua is. And it could be a place that many times we find ourselves with a cloudy perspective. We want to believe that God will do what he says he will do. And maybe as a man or a husband or a father, we want to believe that God will be with us and direct us and supply for our needs. But sometimes our perspective gets cloudy. And fear has a way of clouding our vision in our perspective time and time and time again. It's interesting about this story is that the people in Jericho are scared and the people outside of Jericho might also be scared. They're kind of scared of each other when they haven't even gone to battle yet. And sometimes when we're faced with fear because of a crisis, a need, or a loss, our perspective goes away from God and it goes towards the wall. 
You might be in a place right now where you're just facing the wall and saying, God, all I see is brick. Unless you start moving the bricks, I'm not going to believe. God, unless you move this person, situation, sickness, I'm going to have a hard time believing that you're the God who can save, the God who can redeem, the God who can come close, the God who can heal. Maybe you've been praying a prayer for years and nothing's happened. Maybe instead of facing one wall, now you're facing three walls and you're asking yourself, will he do what he said he would do? I can imagine that Joshua is kind of in an awkward situation because he's the only one hearing from God. And not only is the only one hearing from God, he has to share this message with other people. And so he has to come back to the people and say, hey, look at the wall and the second wall. We can't even maybe see the third wall. We don't know what swords they have or spears. Shoot, we don't even know if they're going to start shooting arrows at us as soon as we get to the wall. But God said that those walls and the people inside of the walls have already been defeated. So what do you all say that we just move forward with God? Sometimes the scariest place to be is the place of promise where God said he would, will do something, but he hasn't done it yet. And those are the places that can be scary, but can be beautiful because they require faith. Require faith. And so I believe sometimes and most of the times we kind of live in the middle between fear and faith. We want to believe that God will bring down the walls and the enemy and the obstacle, but many times the reality pulls us closer to fear. And many times when we're caught in this in-between, we say, God, why don't you just do what you said you would do? Why don't you, why don't you just do it right now? Like, God, what are you waiting for? Like, the timing's right. You know, things need to change. I'm not feeling well. They're not feeling well. well. You might be thinking outside of yourself and thinking about the world and saying, God, the world's not a better place. Why don't you just send Jesus to take us home? Like, what are you waiting for? Like, can you just do it? Now, if I'm really honest with you, many times I kind of find myself in this space right here wondering why God won't do what he said he would do. And maybe my intentions lie in wanting to believe and wanting others to believe that I believe, but reality will always push us and pull us towards fear. The worst place that we can be and stay and kind of linger is in fear. Because fear will tell us something that we're not. It will tell us something the world is not. It will tell us that God is not who he says he is. And the more we linger in fear, the further away we fall from the realities of who God is and what he wants to do in your life. What if? What if? What if God is more interested in developing your faith than your comfort? What if God has allowed certain walls going up in your life because he knows that the battle worth fighting is not necessarily on the walls or inside the walls, but maybe inside of your heart? What if the reason that God has us linger around the wall, looking at the wall and kind of going around the wall is because he knows that something needs to change inside of us? The walls that you're facing today and the walls that I'm facing today are there to build our faith. You might be saying, well, what if God found a better way to build my faith, right? Like, I would go to church every single Saturday if God just found a different way except for walls to build my faith. Like, I would be the most caring person in the entire world, even to that coworker, even to that neighbor, even to that person in my class, if, if he would just remove the walls. Like, like, if God removed all the obstacles and supplied all my needs, I'll be that perfect human being that God wants me to be. Can I tell you a secret? If God removed all the bad in your life, all the obstacles, the needs, the challenges, everything that makes your life tough, he would also need to remove you. The only way that God can develop our faith is through walls. Allowing walls to form in our life, but walking with us as we walk along the wall and through the wall. God is not wanting to build our comfort. He's wanting to build our faith. So not a novel idea, not sophisticated, not too deep. What if we kept praying even when the walls were up? What if we kept praying even though God didn't answer the prayer like we wanted wanted him to? 
But what if we kept studying the word even though we've already memorized 5, 10, 15 Bible texts and we're claiming those 5, 10, 15 Bible texts every day hoping that they come through? What if we kept memorizing more and reading more? What if we began to praise God before he brought the walls down, believing that he will do what he said he will do? You see, sometimes God's waiting for us to develop us as we wait because it's more important how we wait than how we walk through the city. God today wants to develop your faith. He does not want to develop your comfort. So this is the game plan that God tells Joshua. March around the city once with all the armed men and repeat, do this again for how many days? Okay? So it's not just the armed men, it's the priest and it's the Ark of the Covenant. And everyone's dressing up like they're going to go into battle and they've gone into battle before so they're putting on their gear, their helmets, their shields, picking up their swords, sharpening their knives like they're ready to go. They're locked and loaded, ready for battle. No one knows the entire plan except for Joshua. And so Joshua says, okay, guys, we, we got to be ready. Suit up. We're going into battle. Okay, uh, armed guards going first, then the priest with the Ark of the Covenant. Everyone has their instruments like they have their instruments to play as priests and then the soldiers have their weapons weapons. They're ready to go. Like men are saying bye to their wives and their children. They're kissing, hugging, not knowing if they're going to see each other again. They're ready to go. They're concentrated, focused, a little bit nervous, right? Some of them probably took a little bit longer in the bathroom because they're about to go into battle and they, and they get ready to go and they get to the city and march around the entire city. They're waiting to go. They're waiting for that one spear or arrow to fly at them for them to attack and God to do something. But they walk around around the entire city with the people from Jericho looking down and nothing happened and before they realize it they're marching back home I imagine one of the soldiers going back home walking through the doors family looks at him rushes to him hugs him no sweat no blood no dirt like maybe the wife asked him where'd you go <laughs> like, wasn't the battle today, weren't you supposed to be part of the group that went and took Jericho? Like, where, did, where were you? And he maybe said, well, something interesting happened. Interesting is code word for ladies, don't ask me. I end a conversation. And she kind of goes, well, tell me more. <laughs> and that's code word for you need to ask me how I'm doing later. Um, and he kind of says, we, we, we were ready. We were marching at the pace we usually march when we're going to battle, like everyone was ready. And we marched around the entire city and we came back home. And so maybe the wife's like, oh, you went out for a walk. I, no, no, we went around the city and, and came back home. And she said, well, well, the good thing is that you're all right. So he takes off his gear, puts it away. And then the next morning he gets up puts everything back on, game face on, everything's sharpened, everything's ready to go, checks everything two, three times, gets out with his buddies, they're in line, marching again, they march around the entire city like they're ready to go with their hand clutched on their sword, like they're waiting for something to happen, they wish something would happen for something to change this uncomfortable tension, but nothing happens, and so the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, nothing's happened. I don't think this guy's coming back home on the sixth day. I think he's just sleeping somewhere outside, like, like, in a, in a nice, like under a nice tree or somewhere because he doesn't want to come back home and say, we just went out for a walk again. You see, when you don't have the full plan of what's happening, it feels like we're going for a walk and nothing's happening. Like they wished and probably begged God to at least move one stone per day just to reaffirm them that something's happening. Like just one thing to happen, like one plan of development and strategy, like maybe just going back home and building a structure or a weapon to attack Jericho would have been more than just walking around a city like idiots hoping something would happen, but nothing happened. And not only are they just walking around, but their enemy is up above them looking down and maybe every day it's a different joke. 
Maybe every day is a different song. Maybe every day something's different flying down at them and they can't do anything about it. Maybe some of them have gotten to the point where like we were way better with Moses. Like he was a way better leader. Like this never happened with Moses. Like bring him back. Like he died, doesn't matter. Let's just, let's just suit somebody else as Moses and pretend he's Moses because it's better than this. Sometimes it feels like we're on day six for a hundred days or a year or 10 years. We want something to happen, but we keep walking around for something different to happen, for God to do something different, for God to remove a stone or change the situation or add to the equation, but nothing happens. And so Joshua ordered the army to advance and they marched around the city with the armed God going ahead of the ark of the Lord. And so God is present, they're present, they're moving around, but nothing's happening. Nothing's changing. Nothing's moving in the right direction. So the question that I have for us today is, will you keep walking when it doesn't seem to be working? See, at some point in your life, you said, you know, the best thing for me is to join a church. I'm going to start going to church because if I go to church, then God will sprinkle that magical dust and transform my life. Like if I start going to church, then, then my life will be different. You know, everyone's life will be different. But you started coming to church and instead of things getting easier, maybe they started getting harder. Like you started being faithful with what God gives you and provides for your home and you started giving back to God. Instead of God multiplying that, it seems like you have less than you've ever had in your life and you start questioning God. Maybe you tried to be that man in your relationship with your wife and your kids to be that husband or that spouse and the more you try to be a better person, you keep walking around but nothing's happening. You're that faithful uh, employee or you run your business the best way with integrity, but instead of things getting better, they're getting worse or they're not changing, so you keep walking around. So i got to remind you from last week that just because we don't see God moving, it doesn't mean he's not doing anything. It just means that we can't see it. See, just because God is not working the way I want him to because he's a disobedient God where I ask him to do ABC and he's doing somewhere down the alphabet, it does not mean that God's not working on my side or my behalf. You see, will I trust God's promises when I don't see progress in my life? Maybe right now you're walking around in circles wanting to be, believe the promise, but there's no progress. And you're saying, God, if you don't bring promise, progress, I'm not going to believe the promise. God, if you don't change these things, the situation, if you don't change what's happening inside of me, then, then I can't follow you. I won't follow you. I just can't keep doing the same thing. You see, the battle wasn't about the walls or what's happening inside of the walls. The battle that God was fighting was within the hearts of the people. The battle that God is fighting today is not out there. It's in here. Maybe he has you walking in circles because he's working in you. Maybe he has you working in circles because you're not ready for what he's about to do. Maybe he has you walking in circles because only if you're walking in circles will you keep looking up to him to trust him, follow him, obey him with whatever he says in your life. So men, this part's for you. If God has you walking in circles, then keep walking. If God wants you to shift in your life as a husband or as a father, as an employee, as a person in the community, then keep changing. If God just wants you to show up, then keep showing up. If God wants you to put your family first in prayer or to put God's first will first in prayer, then keep praying. If God wants you to go deeper in his word and his promises, then keep going deeper. Because tomorrow's progress depends on today's perseverance. If I give up today, then tomorrow pro tomorrow's progress will fall down. But if I choose to persevere today, if I choose to show up today, if I choose to do the right thing today, if I choose to be loving and forgiving today, if I choose to allow God's spirit in me today, I will see progress tomorrow. You see, God has us going in circles, but we're not going in circles in vain. What's happening in here is more important than what happens out there, so keep walking. God's people walked for days and days, and they were going in circles. They didn't get it. They were maybe bad at God and maybe mad at Joshua, but they kept walking. They kept walking. Six days and nothing happened. 
if they only knew that on day seven the walls would fall? Like how different would your life be if you knew that on day seven the walls in your life would fall? Like what if, what if you knew that the job would come in at day seven? What if you knew that that, that, that house would come in at day seven? What, what if you knew that you know, the relationship would get better at day seven? What if you knew that the sickness would be removed at day seven? How different would you live your life today if you knew that on day seven things would change? You see, I think it would have been easier for them to walk around Jericho if they knew that it was only six days, but the seventh day something would happen. And they would have probably smiled a little bit different at the people of Jericho if they knew that on seven, day seven, those walls were falling down and they were falling down with them. <laughs> if we knew the end before the beginning, I'm sure we would live differently, but it would not require faith. We can choose today to believe that God will do what he said he will do. So what we can do today is to surrender to God. And say, God, I don't know what you have me doing. I'm going in circles and it makes no sense. It makes no sense to me. It makes no sense to the people I talk to. Shoot, it makes no sense to the world. But God, I'm going to surrender my desire to be right. I'm going to surrender my desire to look right. I'm going to surrender my desires for likes in my life. But I'm just going to do what you want me to do. What if we surrendered our pride ourselves in the process, just acknowledging that God will do something on day seven? You see, you're closer than you know. We're closer than we know to day seven. Most of us quit on day six. Most of us let go on day six. Most of us want to restart on day six, thinking that nothing will change or will ever change, but we're closer than we know. What if God's people would have stopped on day four? What if that soldier came home and said, you know, I'm done. Like, I don't want to tell my wife again that I went out for a walk and I didn't help her with the kids. So you know what? Forget that. I'm staying at home. Let them go walk. Like, I'm going to do some productive stuff at home and I'm going to make my life better at home. I don't need to walk around Jericho. I don't need to look like an idiot or a fool. I'm just going to stay right here. What if they would have gave up, given up on day five or day six? It's easy to give up. But men, God doesn't want us to give up. He's put something inside of us to prepare us, equip us, sustain us, to persevere even on day six. So if you're feeling like letting go and quitting, if you're feeling like restarting and going a different direction just because you don't like walking in circles, keep walking in circles because something is going to happen. You might not see it, believe it, or feel it right now, but God is moving. You see, God's people kept moving because they believed that God was going to do something. It says in James chapter 1, verse 4, let perseverance finish this work. Let it finish its work. Keep showing up. Keep doing the right thing. Keep loving, forgiving. Keep giving yourself away so that you may be what? That was very immature. So that you may be what? <laughs> Mature. So that you may grow up so that you may be in a spiritual adult and complete, not lacking anything. Perseverance is the key to be mature and complete, not lacking anything in our lives. You see, most of the time, we're not going to go deep into this one, but we search for everything we're lacking and we're not persevering at anything. So instead of getting something that we're mature and complete at, we have a bunch of things that are unfinished but are unfulfilling. That perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Don't give up. Don't tap out. You're closer than you think. Today is the day, as they say, to man up. Not man up with muscles or being macho or proving that we know something. To man up and say, I'm gonna persevere no matter what. To man up and say, you know what, in spite of the obstacle or the challenges, in spite of my relationship, in spite of my needs, in spite of my feelings, I will continue to persevere. And even if God has me going in circles over and over again, I will gladly go in circles believing that that's the work that God's not only doing out there, but the work that he's doing in here. So if you're walking and angry, keep walking until the anger's gone. 
If you're walking in prideful, keep walking until the pride is gone. If you're walking with selfishness, immaturity, laziness, well, if you keep walking, the laziness will probably walk itself away. So keep walking. And if you're doubtful, if you're doubtful today about who you are or where God has you or the value that you have, keep walking. Because it's when we walk that God begins to speak. It's when we walk that God comes close. It's when we walk that we're reminded of God's faithfulness and his promises and what he wants to do in our lives. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, being confident of this, believing this, having faith in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It might feel like you're walking in circles with walls above you where an impossible task for anything to change out there and here, but keep going. God's doing the work, I'm not doing the work. He's doing the changing, I'm just allowing him. He's guiding, I'm just following. You see, if he's doing the work, there's no pressure on me because I don't need to sustain anything, I don't need to prove anything, I don't need to know anything. I just need to let him do his work. You know, day seven is coming. And part of the instructions that, that God gave Joseph, uh, Joshua were this. He says, on, on the seventh time around, when the priests uh, sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, you're going to shout, you're going to cry out, you're going to praise, because God has given us the city. And they might have said, well, time out, Joshua. What do you mean shout? Are we shouting by throwing our spears? Are we shouting by like letting go our weapons? Like, why are we shouting? <laughs> like, what's the scientific explanation of shouting in battle? They didn't question or second guess. They didn't ask for an explanation. But on the seventh day, when they had walked around the city, they shouted, and not just shouted. You know, there's, there's shouts, right? Like, I know when my kids are shouting just to shout. I also know when my kids are shouting because they're happy about something. It's a different shout. One kind of comes from here, the other comes from down here. The one that comes from down here is stronger. It's more powerful. It's like you have more conviction to shout when it's coming from a victory shout for when something awesome or good or amazing is going to happen. You kind of shout from the inside, from, from down here. And, and they shouted from down here, not because they were angry or frustrated, not because they were tired, not because they were in trouble. They shouted because they believed that on day seven, God was going to show up. What if today was our day to shout? To shout, not just to shout, I want to believe I want to shout, but the shout that says, you know what? I, I, I'm going to believe that God's going to give me whatever said, he said he's going to give me. I, I'm going to shout, not wanting to be convicted as I shout, but I'm going to shout in, until God does something. I, I'm going to praise him until he moves. I'm going to give him all glory and honor over my life and the world until he shows the direction, the way, the form that he wants me to move in life. And so when the trumpet shouted, when the men gave a loud shout, the walls came down. I just put myself in the story and I'm like one of those soldiers looking up and I'm shouting and maybe I expected God to open up the city gates to let us through. Uh, maybe I expected God to cause the, the king or the enemy to surrender and they would come walking out with, with all their weapons behind. But as they shouted, the walls, the obstacle, what was in front of them between them and the promised land, it, it just started crumbling. What seemed impenetrable and what seemed uncollapsible began to collapse in front of them and they just charged in and they took the city. They took it. They took the city and they ran through the city and there was nothing in front of them that could get in their way because God had been moving way before they arrived to Jericho or Canaan. God had been moving before they even had the idea of following God. God was just waiting for them to be ready to bring the walls down. 
So what's between you today and those walls coming down? Well, what's between you today and God giving you the victory? What's between you today and God giving you that desire to praise Him with everything that's inside of you, with everything that's around you? What's between you today from being that man that God wants you to be? If you're married, for being a husband that's faithful to your wife and willing to give yourself to her like God gives himself for the church. Today, if you're a father, what's getting between you and becoming the father that God wants you to be and prioritizing your children, their safety and their upgrowing and, and their decisions and their life. If, if you're just a man in this world, what's between you and becoming that person that God wants you to be between you and, and God helping you become that warrior? What's in between? And what's stopping you today from giving him all glory and praise? I was, I was driving to church this morning and um, I got caught with one of those rainstorms early on and it got to the point where I couldn't see anything in the car on 285 and I thought about stopping and, and, and staying there, but because I'm a man, I kept going. And, <laughs> and and as I'm going through the rain and just slowed down and trying to go as safe as I can, um, you heard that, Savannah. Um, <laughs> this song popped into my head that I hadn't heard in a very, very long time. And it's a song that I, that I learned when I was in choir in high school and just kept ringing in my head. And so I, I uh, put it on the phone and put it in the car and just started. Uh, I worshiped before I got here, I'm sorry. Um, I just worshiped God over and over again. Um, the title of the song is, um, is the, the author is Richard Smallwood. If you haven't heard the song, you, you should hear it today. It's called Total Praise. Um, and, the, and, and the words are like this. It says, Lord, I will lift my eyes to the hills, knowing my help is coming from you, your peace you give me in the time of the storm. You are the source of my strength. You are the strength of my life. I lift my hands in total praise to you. And so I listened to the song once. I wasn't to church yet. I played it again. And then I got to church. I didn't have my keys. I'm being fully transparent today. I listened to it again. I was waiting for someone to get here. And, and as I'm listening to the song, I'm like, what, what caused the author to write these words? And so I quickly went on Google and I found the reason. Uh, apart from his, uh, a segment from his book um, titled Smallwood, written in 2019 and page 368, Richard Smallwood says this. He says, total praise was born out of anguish of caring for my ailing mother and terminally ill God brother and dealing with the emotional issues of my foster brother. I felt helpless as I watched my loved one suffering. I wanted to write a pity party song. I wanted to develop it musically into a song that asked God for help. However, the more I worked on it, the more it kept going in the, in the direction of a praise song. So as I read this this morning, it spoke to me that as he kept going in circles, as he kept dealing with impossible situations, asking for God to do something, to change something, as he's walking around day six over and over again, as he's thinking about this and wanting to kind of dwell in his own pity, God changed his pity to praise. God said, I'm going to bring those walls down where they're right now, tomorrow, in the future, but I will bring them down. How about you just praise me right now for what I will do, and you'll see that you'll transform yourself into the warrior that I desire you to be. Maybe today you're kind of in that pity season. kind of repeating that same track over and over again, the one that makes you cry or just think about all the painful things in life. And you're feeling sorry for yourself and wanting others to feel sorry for you and kind of just in that season. But what if today we let God move us from pity to praise? Maybe you're walking around wanting for something to happen to be able to supply and to give to your family, but the more you try, the worse it is, and you're just in that fear of getting stuck over and over again? What if we turned over our weakness and received his strength? And maybe you're just trying to do something big for God. You're trying to share your faith with people around you. You're trying to live out your Christianity, but the more you try to be that person that Jesus wants you to be, the 
harder it is. And the more people get in your way, or family members, or neighbors, or just people online just getting in your way, bringing you down. What if today you said, no, not today, fear, not today, Satan, not today, so-and-so, today, I'm trusting God. If that's where you are right now, just wanting God to bring those walls down, but you're on day one or day six, I want to invite you to stand up. I want you to stand up and say, God, I, I, I want to keep walking even though I feel like sitting down. God, I, I feel like giving up because I've tried over and over again, but today I stand up believing that you will do what you say you will do. So if that's what you want for your life today, then stand up. If you want to receive that freedom and liberty in Jesus' name, stand up. If you want to receive what Jesus did for you on the cross and today confess that he is your savior, that he died for you on the cross and because of him you can stand up today, then stand up. Today can be that day that the walls come down and that you start that new life in Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you're that good God, but you're that good Father as well. That when you saw us struggling that when you saw us living in fear and brokenness and pain and loss, you did not leave us alone, but you started a plan. You started moving. Before Adam and Eve could ever sense you moving, you had already developed a plan all the way to the cross and beyond. So we thank you, Father, today that you don't give up on us. We thank you that you don't leave us alone. We thank you that you don't abandon us, that you're that good Father that was willing to give us your Son. And because you sent Jesus into the, into the world, by believing in him today, those walls of sin come down in our lives. Those walls that hold us back, the walls that push us away, the walls that tell us that we're not good enough or that we've done too many bad things are removed and we become these new creations through Jesus and in Jesus and for Jesus. So, Father, today, in Jesus' name, we want to proclaim the victory over everyone in this space and online. Jesus, today, we're walking on day four, five, and six. Nothing's happening, but we're standing up and praising you because we know that you're moving. Father, we might be a little bit tired from walking. We want things to change in our time. But today, we surrender our plans and our wills, saying that you're the God that knows all things, the end from the beginning. So we choose to put all of our faith and trust in you. Help us to sing out that victory song today to proclaim and give you all honor and glory and praise because we know that one day all bad things and loss, all death will be put away and we'll be able to sing with you, in front of you, for you, through all of eternity in heaven. And God's people said, Amen.